Greetings students and welcome to another video on special relativity. In this lesson we're going to derive the equation for time dilation and solve an example problem. So let's begin. Suppose I have an observer A standing stationary on a train platform. The reference frame of observer A is R. Now since observer A is stationary, that is his velocity is zero, the reference frame R is inertial. Recall that an inertial reference frame is a reference frame with a constant velocity. So a stationary reference frame like R has a constant velocity of zero, making it inertial. Suppose also that I have a train moving at a constant velocity of V to the right, and inside this train is an observer B. The reference frame of B is R prime. This reference frame is also an inertial reference frame because it's moving at a constant velocity. Say that I put a source of light on the floor of the train like this, and a mirror that's vertically above the source of light on the ceiling of the train like this. Let's call this distance the distance between the source of light and the mirror. Let's call that distance h. Now, when observer b exactly lines up with observer a, what we'll do is we'll set the clocks in both reference frames to zero, so that the time in r is ti equals zero, and the time in r prime is ti prime equals zero. The i is the subscript for initial. As soon as the clocks in both reference frames are set to zero, we'll have observer B switch on the light source so that the light source fires a ray of light towards the mirror. And at this point, we're gonna make two point of view drawings. We'll start with the point of view of observer B, the observer who's in the train that's moving along with the light source in the reference frame R prime. Now, according to observer B, when the light source is switched on, the ray of light travels vertically upwards strikes the mirror, and then travels back down to the source. This is pretty common sense. If you shine a laser on the floor towards a mirror and you're sealing, the laser is going to go up and then reflect back down. Observer B isn't moving anywhere with respect to the source and mirror, so this is what the situation looks like to him. According to observer B, the speed of the light ray is C, which makes sense. The distance the light ray travels is 2h because it goes 1h up and then 1h down. Therefore, the time taken by the light ray to go up and then come back down is delta t naught equals 2h over c. I'll call this equation 1. Observer b was pretty easy to understand, but let's get real empathetic and look at things from observer a's perspective. So observer a is standing on a train platform at rest with respect to the ground. In observer a's frame of reference, the source of light and the mirror are moving at a velocity v to the right. I'm not going to draw the rest of the train, just the source and the mirror to keep things simple. After a certain time interval delta t, the ray of light will have reflected back to the source. However, both the source and the mirror would have moved a distance of v delta t forward. But what would the situation look like halfway between delta t and zero, in other words at delta t over 2? Well, by that stage, the light ray will be in the middle of its path of going up and down, so at delta t over 2, the ray of light will be reflecting off the mirror to come back down. Obviously, the horizontal distance that passes between when the light ray comes out of the source and when the light ray hits the mirror is v delta t over 2. The same applies to the horizontal distance that passes between when the light ray reflects off the mirror and goes back to the source. So let's summarize what happens in observer A's frame of reference. At time zero on observer A's clock, the light ray comes off the source. Then at time delta t over two, the light ray bounces off the mirror, but the source and the mirror also travel a distance v delta t over two horizontally. Finally, at time delta t, the light ray comes back down to the source again, but the source and the mirror have once again traveled a distance v delta t over two horizontally. So essentially, according to observer A, the light ray travels diagonally up to the mirror and then diagonally back down to the source. Now, the vertical distance between the source and mirror is h, which means that by the Pythagorean theorem, this diagonal distance that the ray of light travels is the square root of h squared plus v delta t over 2 whole squared. However, it travels this diagonal distance when going up to the mirror, and it travels the same diagonal distance when going down to the mirror. So the total distance the ray of light travels according to observer A is two times uh, this d. To find the total time delta t it takes for the ray of light to travel back to the source in observer A's reference frame, we'll need the total distance the ray of light travels in that reference frame, which is d divided by the speed of light. 
But what is the speed of light in A's reference frame? Well, it's just C. Recall that the speed of light is constant in all inertial reference frames according to the second postulate of special relativity. Now, if we weren't in special relativity, if we were just using classical mechanics, the speed of light in A's reference frame would actually be the square root of C squared plus V squared, because there's an additional horizontal component that gets added to the speed of the light, and that horizontal component is equal to the velocity of the train or the V. But when we're talking in relativistic mechanics, then according to the second postulate of special relativity, even when the source of light is moving with respect to A, the speed of light is still C. Let's plug in the D from this equation up here, which means that delta T will be the following. We want to isolate delta T on one side, so we'll square both sides as such, multiply out the C squared, and then take the V delta T over 2 term to the left, isolate delta T squared, and then take the square root of both sides. Finally, if we use equation 1 and plug in the fact that h is just c delta t naught over 2, this is what we'll get for delta t. The 2's cancel and we'll move the c down to the denominator. When that happens, we get delta t equals delta t naught over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Essentially, what this equation says is that the time interval between two events in one reference frame, delta t naught, changes in a different reference frame that's moving with respect to the delta t naught reference frame, and that the change can be described by a factor of 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, which is also defined as gamma, the Lorentz factor. In other words, if I have a clock in my own reference frame, then that clock might measure a time interval between two events in that same reference frame to be delta t naught, also known as the proper time. However, if those two events occur in a reference frame that's moving with respect to my clock, then my clock will actually measure a larger time interval delta t between those same two events, and that delta t will be larger than delta t naught by a factor of gamma. This phenomenon that a moving clock, a clock that's moving with respect to two temporally separated events, this phenomenon that a moving clock runs slower is called time dilation. It tells us that time is relative, just like how motion is relative according to the first postulate of special relativity. Let's solidify our understanding of time dilation by going through an example problem. Suppose that a beloved gaming protagonist boards a spaceship with a trained golfer, who I'll call Observer A. I'm sure many of you know where this is going. This spaceship departs Earth and travels at a constant velocity of beta times c, where c is the speed of light. This question has two parts. The first part says, assuming the time it takes for the golfer to find out that the protagonist killed her father is tau 1 seconds, how long does an observer O on Earth have to wait before they hear the radio transmission of the protagonist's first screams? Part B then switches things up. If observer O is expecting when observer A departs, then according to observer A, how long would it take observer O to deliver with a remaining gestation time that is tau 2 seconds? So now that we've stated our problem, let's start by drawing a figure to quickly describe what's going on. We have an observer O on Earth, which is stationary relative to itself. We also have an observer A traveling at beta C relative to Earth. The time for observer A to realize the truth is tau 1 seconds, which happens to also be delta T naught our proper time interval. Calculating the time delta t it'll take for observer A to start golfing in the Earth reference frame is pretty simple. Just straight up plug everything into the time dilation formula and we'll get delta t scream equals tau 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. After simplification. This is the time it'll take for the first protagonist screams to be heard as measured by observer O. If you don't understand the reference, then basically when observer A finds out the protagonist killed her father, she immediately starts beating him with a golf club and he starts screaming, and that's the whole point I'm making. Anyway, notice that this time interval is larger than the time tau 1. This makes sense. The time interval for the moving observer A to start golfing, as measured by an observer on Earth, is dilated compared to the proper time interval. This is the entire idea of time dilation. To someone on Earth, the moving clock of observer A runs slower. But we're not quite done with part A just yet. 
We also have to calculate the time it takes for the signal from the first screens to reach observer O. I'll call this time delta T sig. Since this is a radio signal, it'll travel at the speed of light back to Earth. The distance d that the signal travels equals the velocity of observer A multiplied by the time delta t screen. We're using delta t screen because that's the time measured by observer O. It's how long observer A was away until the screaming according to observer O. Therefore, the distance traveled by A will be according to the time delta t screen. This means that the total time is delta t screen plus delta t sig, which is just 1 plus beta times tau 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. So that does it for part A. Let's do part B, where observer O is also expecting when observer A departs. The question asks us how long it would take for observer O to deliver the child according to observer A. Pause the video and think about this for a second. The answer isn't tau 2, even though observer O is in the quote-unquote stationary reference frame. It's actually delta t birth, which is tau 2 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. This is because relative to observer A, observer O is also traveling at a velocity of beta c, just in the opposite direction. So according to A, observer O is a moving clock that should run slower. So the time interval elapsed for O to give birth in A's reference frame is dilated, just like the time interval elapsed for A to start golfing in O's reference frame. This is why the answer is delta t birth and not the simple gestational time tau 2. Now this is a fairly standard time dilation problem with a couple of twists that can trick you if you didn't read the question properly. Now you might be wondering why I've become interested in protagonists getting beat up by golf clubs all of a sudden. It's because of the masterpiece The Last of Us Part II, which has unanimously been hailed by gamers as the greatest. And this is where my interest comes from. Let me know in the comments what you guys think of The Last of Us Part II. I hope to achieve the same degree of civility that the Metacritic reviews and online forum discussions have achieved. Anyway, that should do it for the video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.